grace and peace to you and welcome to worship at Eastminster Presbyterian Church. We're so glad that you could join us for this time of worship and reflection. I just have two announcements of the body. On June 6th, our worship times will be changing. We will have a 9 a.m. outdoor service and an 11 a.m. Uh, live stream. Next Sunday um, will be the last Sunday if you'd like to order grocery, card, car, grocery cards for June. Next Sunday is the last day to participate in that event. Let us worship God together. As a people, we are called to worship the living God. Remember the promise of the Lord. God will pour out the Spirit on all flesh. Jesus says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me. Out of a believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin together. Almighty God, you poured your spirit upon gathered disciples, creating bold tongues, open ears, and a new community of faith. We confess that we hold back the force of your spirit among us. We do not listen to the word of grace, speak the good news of your love, or live as a people made one in Christ. Have mercy on us, O God. Transform our timid lives by the power of your spirit and fill us with a flaming desire to be your faithful people, doing your will, 
for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Christ, God has poured out the Holy Spirit upon us for the forgiveness of sins. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. boys and girls. I wanted to talk this morning to you a little bit about what today is. Well, I know it's Sunday, but it's also a very special day in the life of the church. Today is something called Pentecost, and it is actually when we celebrate the birthday of the church. We all love birthdays, right? We love gathering together when we're able to with family. We love getting maybe a special meal. Do you guys get a special meal in your family? And that wonderful opportunity that we have with getting a cake or some sort of fun dessert. I remember one of my sons, he absolutely loves peanut butter balls. Sometimes you might see those at Christmas. One year he decided that's what he wanted uh, for his cake. But getting a cake, and we put something on that cake. We put candles, right? Those candles might reflect the number of years that we have lived, and everyone sings together, asking for you to have a happy birthday. On this day in Pentecost, we celebrate the birthday of the church, when the church began. One of the symbols for Pentecost is a flame that we see on a candle. So this, time, this day, I want you to remember the birthday of the church. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the gift of the church the birthday, the renewal, and the life we get through it. In Jesus' name, amen. A reading from Acts chapter 2, verses 17 to 21. In the last days, God, in the last days it will be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall see visions. Your, your old, young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved.
reading from John 15, 26 and 27. When the advocate comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who comes from the Father will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Enlighten us, O God, by your spirit. In the understanding of your word, grant us the grace to receive it in, in true humility that we may learn to put our trust in you, to honor you, by glorifying your holy name in all our life and to yield to you with love and obedience. Seeing as it has led you to call us to be your servants and your children. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the unique things about being a pastor is that you never really know how people will respond when they find out you are a pastor. Sometimes a person starts telling you about their church. Usually it's a positive story about the things they love about their own congregation. But other times, they will list to you the litany of things that they are upset about. Occasionally, they will ask you for prayer. I have prayed in a few different car repair shops before for people. But in general, most people do not know how to respond to this. This career has really changed the way it's perceived in the community. I remember when we put our oldest son into a daycare program. The director was sitting there with my wife and I. We were making small talk. She asked us what we did. My wife told her that she was a school counselor at the time, and they talked a little bit about that. Then the director looked at me and asked what I did. Generally, at the time, I would usually respond that I work with youth trying to empower them to make good choices. But for some reason in that moment, I said that I was a pastor. And she looked at me making a face and said, oh, we've never had one of those. The Reverend Andrew Troutman Taylor shares how on occasion... When people discover that he is a pastor, the bold among them will like to challenge the notion of God's existence. They will often point out to Andrew the tragic, the terrible, the shootings, the floods, the cancer. And for them, this disproves the idea of a loving, creative force in this universe. When he hears this argument, he affirms this as a good question and says that he really does not have a good answer for this. But then he shares with them a spiritual practice, a practice of the poet Charlotte Matthews, a practice that she has taken on over the year. It is a list that she cultivates personally that she calls her God exists lists. Charlotte Matthews, instead of focusing on dogma or doctrine or theological argument, simply writes a list of those funny little happenstances that bring her comfort, joy, and welcome. For example, one that she wrote about was at the end of an absolutely awful, terrible day. She was walking out of a convenience store carrying a microwavable dinner, and she glanced down to the pavement. 
while looking down, she saw a cheap plastic keychain that simply read, I love you. Charlotte's only rule for this list is that she adds to it. She never takes away. It makes me wonder, what would you put on your God exists list? If you made a list, what funny little happenstances in your life would you write down? In our text from Acts, the day has finally come. Jesus has ascended to heaven. The Holy Spirit has arrived in force. And the disciples are gathered for the festival of Pentecost. The meaning of this Jewish festival has changed over the years. But there is a common thread that, that weaves all these themes together. together. That God is giving to us good gifts. At first, this, this festival was celebrated as part of a harvest, an expression of thanksgiving to God, to God for God's faithfulness, supplying the needs of all people, of sons, of daughters, of male and female slaves, of strangers, of orphans, and of widows. But then the focus of the festival moved to focusing on the 10 instructions for faithful living or the 10 commandments, the gift that God gave in the Torah. As Christians, we have reinterpreted this even further, becoming associated with the coming of the Holy Spirit What's common among these that is that in all interpretations, the idea is that God is giving something to us. We are in need and God is gifting something to us. Peter lays out a beautiful vision where God's spirit is poured out on all flesh, sons and daughters, young and old, male and female. The spirit equips everyone to speak about God's deeds of power regardless of gender, ethnicity, or even social status. I think it is truly significant that the first work of the spirit is to break down boundaries between people, to build connection with one another and remind people of the historical inbreaking of God, that God broke into history. In John, we see another interpretation of this moment. Jesus says in this text that the advocate will come it is an interesting title for the Holy Spirit. It is consistent with the way John interprets Jesus' work. This word advocate has legal connotations. It is the act of the Spirit pleading on behalf of communities in the face of of opposition. Jesus is speaking directly into this moment, into their context, the context that the disciples will face. Not only will they face oppression from Rome, but they will wrestle with how do they understand Jesus? How do they understand this Jesus movement that they are a part of? Will this Jesus movement become part of Judaism? Will it remain a sect of Judaism? Or will it become some, something completely new? I believe this text also offers to us a way to consider how power operates. When this was written, Christians were a tiny little sect a minority of just a few people. They were worried about persecution from everyone. But as the church gained power over the centuries, they forgot what it was like to be a tiny persecuted sect. 
and rather than protecting others, they exerted power to propagate death-dealing systems. So how do we understand these texts? We have the coming of an advocate. We have a festival that focuses on the good gifts that God has given to us. And we have a God who is pouring out God's spirit on all flesh, causing visions and dreams and the breakings of all boundaries. All of these are records of God's inbreaking, of breaking into history, of destroying death-dealing systems, and saying, here I am, and I am love. This is a list that is literally thousands of years old that screams that God exists. So the question before us, what would we put on our own list? For me, a couple things immediately come to mind. The first thing that I would put on my list is the voice of Scripture. The more I study Scripture, the more I am amazed by it. The beauty of it, the breadth, the depth of it. But the thing that I am always struck by when I read Scripture is that it shouldn't exist. It is a record of a people that were enslaved a record of a people that were conquered time after time. And in all those accounts, they recorded voices of people that should not have been recorded. The story of Jonah is truly a story about God showing love to enemy. Our God should not be on the side of our enemies. Yet this record exists, screaming out to us, saying, God loves all people. The very first witnesses of the resurrection are women. Women who had no right to testify in court. Women who were told, who were forced to walk at least seven steps behind their husbands at this time. And these are the first witnesses to resurrection. The people that Jesus even surrounds himself with, they are the people that have been rejected. These are not the good Jewish boys that were called to study scripture. And this theme pops up again and again throughout all of Scripture, that God chooses those whom have been rejected, that God holds power to account. And it was all recorded. I would put on my list the testimony of so many believers that I have interacted with over a lifetime. People who take time to care for others, who create community for people in need, who sacrifice for something larger. I would put on my list the ways in which I see God renewing the church The church will never look the way it looked 50 years ago. But God is not done with the church. Pentecost is a perpetual testimony of that. I recently read an article about a church called the Church of the Open Table. It is a church in Kansas City. It was actually started by Second Presbyterian of Kansas City, they put together a call for a missionary to come to their own community because they realized as a congregation that they did not know their neighbors, they did not know the people around them, and they were only reaching a small population. So they began the church of the open table. A church 
that is a church of peace and reconciliation in a city that is deeply divided. A church that is a committed anti-racist church seeking to bring in people of color to speak and lead. They meet around tables for a shared meal and they talk about faith, spirituality, and politics. Things you're not supposed to talk about with strangers. They have found that everyone learns from these conversations. They learn about the city that they live in, organizations they can partner with, and ways to make the community more reflective of God's vision. The church has become incredibly diverse with people of all backgrounds coming to engage in the dialogue. Wendy Brockes, one of the leaders, described it this way. She said, I often catch myself just stopping for a moment and looking out at the room. It occurs to me that I am seeing the gospel before my eyes. Strangers becoming friends, guests becoming hosts. It is the closest I have ever come to seeing the gospel in real life. God's spirit is not done with the church. God is speaking to us this day, asking what we will be, who we will become, and calling us to renewal. Let us pray. Merciful God, we thank you that you speak to us. That you speak to us through the record of history, the testimony of other believers, and the work that you are doing in this world. May we faithfully listen to your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us affirm our faith together by reading the words printed in our bulletin. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was given to the church. In pouring his spirit on many peoples, God overcomes the divisions of Babel. Now people from every tongue, tribe, and nation are gathered into the unity of the body of Christ. Jesus stays with us in the spirit who renews our hearts 
moves us to faith, leads us in the truth, stands by us in our needs, and makes our obedient fresh and vibrant. The Spirit thrusts God's people into worldwide mission. He impels young and old men and women to go next door and far away in the trade, science, art, media, and marketplace with the good news of God's grace. The Spirit goes before them and with them. <coughs> convincing the world of sin and pleading the cause of Christ. The Spirit's gifts are here to stay in a rich variety, fitting responses to timely needs. We thankfully see each other as gifted members of the fellowship, which delights in the creative Spirit's work. God gives more than enough to each believer for God's praise and our neighbor's welfare. Amen. God has gifted us with so many blessings. With the gifts that we have received, we give back to God so that God's mission in this world may be advanced and God's glory may abound. As a church, we believe in the power of prayer. Remember that you can submit prayer concerns to the office through calling or emailing. This day, we continue to be in prayer for Reverend Michael Campbell, for Glenda Fleshman, for Judy Lightfoot, and for Barbara Thompson. We're also in um, gratitude and thankfulness for the uh, service yesterday as we celebrated the promises of resurrection for Steve Beach. We're thankful for everyone who helped uh, make that happen yesterday. Let us go to God in prayer. Holy Spirit, creator in the beginning, you moved over the waters. From, all, from your breath, all creation drew life. Without you, O oh God, life turns to dust. Holy Spirit, you came as fire to the first disciples. You gave us voice before the rulers with, of the world. Without you, we can do nothing, O oh God. Sanctifier, you created us children of God. You make us the living temple of your presence. Without you, we are not fully alive or fully known. Oh God, we trust all this about who you are. That you, oh God, are the revolutionary power of love. That you, oh God, are the world changing power of mercy. And oh God, we need you. We need your love and your mercy in these days. These days can feel like anxious days, fear-filled days. Violence, communities at war, a pandemic. People not feeling seen or known or loved our own ever-sharpening ability to be quick to dismiss or disparage or ignore others. We need you, O oh God. We need you to move over us like you moved over those waters, bringing life and goodness, beauty out of chaos and disorder. We need you to come as fire as you did for those first disciples, the fire of your Pentecostal passion. 
Set us aflame, O God. Keep the heat stoked within our hearts. We need you, O God, to come to us and once again mold us into the temples of your presence. Make us living and breathing proclaimers of your claim on this world. Make us a people who refuse to turn our backs on each other, on any of your children. A people committed to seeing your beautiful divine image in every single face that we come across. A people who are ready to live as the whole worldwide family. We need you, O oh God. We need you to keep moving, to keep surprising us, keep coming at us from new directions with your warmth, your revolutionary love, and your world-changing mercy. Help us to keep moving and living in the ways you have spoken to us. And God, this day we name those before you in prayer. And we lift to you those unspoken and spoken prayers of our heart. We pray for Michael, for Glenda, for Judy, and Barbara. We pray all of this in your name, O oh God, our creator, our savior, and our sustainer. We pray the way you once taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Go into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to that which is good, repaying no evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.